Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Brooke Warner, and I'm here with Linda Joy Myers. Hi, Linda Joy. Hi, Brooke, and hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Yes, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. We'd love for you to uh, give us a shout out, say hi in the window, and let us know that you're here. So um, thank you. And uh, this class, How Do Issue-Driven Memoirs Work and What Makes Them Sell, is a continuation of our best-selling memoir series that we've been teaching. And we've done quite a number of books, including H is for Hawk, The Liars Club, um, Eat, Pray, Love, Wild, and lots of you have been here with us for many of those, and we appreciate it, and we're just going to keep going. And this time, we're teaching two books, Smashed and Drinking a Love Story. So, hi, everybody. Well, the, uh, the fun thing about all this is that um, every time we teach it, people find more that they can learn from these bestsellers, like why they are a bestseller from the class, this, this short class, and then in the four-week classes, you know, how you can draw upon these, this teaching for your own work, and we'll be, we'll be covering that today, too. Exactly. So lots of you already know us, but we'll give a quick intro for those of you who might be new, and we'll start with you, Linda. Okay. I'm Linda Joy Myers. I'm the president of the National Association of Memoir Writers. And I'm the author of several books. Uh, my memoir is called Don't Call Me Mother. And The Power of Memoir and Journey of Memoir are books about memoir writing. And you can uh, just Google National Association of Memoir Writers and find some of the free programs that we offer as well as membership levels. Yeah, and it's such a great and supportive organization. And I am Brooke Warner, a publisher of She Writes Press and president of Warner Coaching, where I coach writers to publication. And I have a new book coming out in June called Greenlight Your Book. And my previous book is What's Your Book? <laughs> so I've been joking mm -hmm. that I have to keep putting the word book in my titles. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I have How to Sell Your Memoir, which is an ebook uh, for those of you who might be ready to write a proposal at some point and shop your memoir to agents and editors. Uh, and then we've co-written Breaking Ground on Your Memoir, with a which a lot of you already have. And it's a short little book, easy to just stick in your purse for inspiration and craft. Um, and that's who we are. And we're excited to dive into this material tonight. Yes, so, we are. <laughs> yes. Uh, this, this class, uh, Addiction Memoirs, I think it's important for all of you to consider that addiction memoir is really just issue driven, which is how we are framing the class tonight. And Linda Joy is going to talk more about issues specifically. But addiction memoirs are so popular because they are um, they're really driven by this analysis and issue. <laughs> That's funny. I put the analysis of a driven driven memoir. That's one way to put it. <laughs> it should say issue Very driven. driven. <laughs> yes, a <laughs> driven, driven memoir. Um, but, mm -hmm. but really, it's, it's kind of a, um, a Freudian slip, I guess, because that's right. You know, it is very driven by issues. And that is what makes it uh, particularly compelling to agents and editors who are looking for things that are going to sell. And so why do issues sell? Uh, partly because they're very tangible. You can put your finger right on it. These two books that we're going to talk about tonight are about drinking. Uh, and so it's a very specific kind of addiction. There are other kinds of addiction memoirs like drug addiction books. There are, there are lots and lots of examples. Um, famously, there's a book duo by a father and son. Uh, the, the father's book is called A um, Beautiful Boy. David Chef, I believe is his last name. And, and then his son wrote a book called Tweak. And it was basically the father-son addiction memoir um, because the son was addicted and I believe he was on meth and the father wrote the story of what it was like to be his dad. And so both of those were addiction memoirs as well, even though one was through the lens of not being addicted himself, but having an addicted child. Uh, I, I think a lot of you know that I used to be the executive editor at Seal Press, and I worked there from 2004 to 2012, um, and I was kind of trained to look for issue-driven memoirs. They're, they're very easy to position. They're easy to sell to the marketing and sales folks because you can talk about it and say, okay, look, statistically, we know that there are X number of drinkers in the United States, um, all people who 
are alcoholics or recovering alcoholics or uh, related to an alcoholic or who just have a complicated relationship with alcohol for that matter would be interested in this book and suddenly the numbers of people who are interested in this book shoot very very high because that's a big number of people if not everyone um, and I we always say in book publishing don't try to be all things to all people so the issue driven memoir also gives you a very specific way to get into your readers hearts and and heads through this very specific lens of your particular issue. So when I say that addiction memoir is high concept, what I mean by that is that it's easy to talk about. It's, it's pretty high level. This book, um, Drinking a Love Story, you don't really need to know much more than the title to know what it's about. And smashed, you know, maybe you don't know the slang smashed means to get totally wasted or drunk, but then partnered with the subtitle, story of a drunken girlhood, all of a sudden, it's pretty clear what the book is about. And that is what high concept means. It just means that it's easy to wrap your mind around and easy to understand. Issue driven books have a hook. Uh, what that means is into popular culture, into social issues, into topical trends. Uh, for those of you who've heard me talk about platform, it's easy to build a platform around an issue. And so if you have a memoir that has an issue, but you're not really looking at the issue front and center, but rather treating it kind of secondarily, you might want to frame your memoir around the issue because suddenly you have a lot of different things to talk about. You know, these two authors, if they were publishing in today's day and age and were trying to build a platform, would have a lot to write about with regard to drinking and the culture. Um, both of these women, you know, women authors writing about, um, about alcohol are also writing about alcohol through the lens of being female what is it like to be a drinker and to be self-abusive and to um, you know interact with other people as a woman and and that's an interesting topic and there's a lot to uncover there even beyond what they've done in their memoirs um, I said here that hot topic issues aren't in danger of becoming obsolete we don't need to worry that alcoholism is going away tomorrow or in five years or in 20 years for that matter, it's always going to be an issue. And, and these kinds of books are perennial for that reason. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a, a great thing, but it certainly is around and it's part of our culture. And if anything, we're becoming more addicted. And so people want to understand it and they want to understand different people's journeys to the other side. And so both of these books have very different trajectories to how the authors got to the other side of their addictions. Um, you know, they're different ages, they're different generations, they have very different um, perspectives. And you could read 10 memoirs about alcoholics and have very different experiences. I mean, and James Fry, even though he got dinged for lying about his memoir, his book, A Million Little Pieces, is also about being an alcoholic, um, but it's just on the other side. You know, it's the rehab journey. So there are just so many different areas that you can enter into. Uh, and I did want to give a shout out to a seal book um, that's out right now called The Big Fix. Um, and this is a new memoir out in hardback right now, um, which was recently on NPR. And the reason I bring it up is because it's a it's a heroin um, addiction book and it's getting a lot of attention. Again, it's called The Big Fix. And so these books are just always out in the world and people really gravitate toward them for lots of reasons, in part to see that hopeful journey through to the other side. So, so they do work and, and these are some of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very powerful stuff. And it does reflect our culture, of course, in so many ways. Um, and so we want to help you uh, think about, you know, how and why are these books so powerful? And and it's clear many of you may not, many of you may, but some of you may not be writing specifically about addiction itself. But you can still learn from this uh, theme-driven memoir, and we're going to talk about how uh, how you can learn from that and apply it to yourself. And so um, one of the things that I noticed is that uh, in both books, um, they take the subject and address it from different angles. And so one angle is, I'm completely lost in my drinking. 
Uh, this could be about being in love. This could be about sex addiction. This could be about, you know, trying to get along with your family. Um, you know, your theme could be a whole bunch of different things. And what you want to think about is um, how are you going to um, both think about the where the story goes and what the specifics are. What are you trying to show um, your audience? Because you will you will have an audience when you're when you're published, and and it needs to be a story that is both your very very personal story and a story people can to and connect with. And so what's interesting to me about in Carolyn Knapp at the very beginning is that immediately she, her first is about how she loves drinking. I mean, the, the theme of it, is, the title is the theme, drinking, a love story. <laughs> um, and, and she has, uh, we'll talk more about structure later, but just briefly, she has uh, chapters that talk about exactly what her theme is. And I'm going to go over that in more detail. But the first one is the prologue. And she says, it happened this way. I fell in love. And then because the love was ruining everything I cared about, I had to fall out. So in one sentence, <laughs> she actually brilliantly um, uh, has the arc of the book. Uh, but in there is a lot of very, very important detail. Um, and so one of the things to look at in these books is how does the writer bring you in and how do you stay engaged as you're reading it? And some of you may not have read these books yet, and some of you probably have read them. And we're going to go into them in detail, of course, in, in the four-week course. But um, we feel the seductive pull of alcohol by her use of language, her use of scenes. It becomes immediately deeply psychological with confessions. So the the... In, in Carolyn Knapp's book, you know, we, we jump in that way. In Smashed, it's an interesting presentation. She, um, she presents drinking like an initiation, and it's almost sexual in feeling. It's on page 10. She says, my first time will be with Natalie. Uh, the context of the drinking of these young, young girls is the close friendship that they have. And so one of the themes that goes through the book all the way is the friendship between these girls and how they all drink and hide drinking and run around and get in trouble in scene after scene after scene. The one thing you'll notice in Smashed is that uh, a lot more scenes are being used uh, in Smashed than Carolyn Knapp. Though Carolyn Knapp, she writes in scenes too. She takes us into a specific moment will define a scene, a, a specific moment in place and time is when a scene occurs. She takes us in and then she pops us out. She uses the narrator in different ways and it's very, very interesting. We're going to uh, analyze that um, later on in, in our teaching. So um, the, you, you need to think, there's some tips that we can offer you about finding the theme and focus of your book. And one of them is to think about the lesson like I was saying earlier, what information do you need to convey to the reader? You can start with listing five points you want your reader to take away. Um, Brooke is going to talk more about takeaway, which is a term that will define, but basically, you know, it's what do you want your reader to learn. And they both do this in different ways. And so it's very interesting to compare how NAP offers information, quite she weaves it through about AA. Uh, pretty much all the way through. And Corin uh, offers information about, um, she uses, for instance, the you voice in one on page 27 in one section where she's wanting the, the reader to connect with her, um, you know, connect with her experience. She says, you throw back that little jigger of liquor with the same urgency with a, which a gun fires ammunition into open space. You feel the same ringing in your ears and the same kickback in your arms and chest, et cetera. And she goes on. So when she's talking to you, the reader, you feel what she's talking about. It's a very interesting technique um, that we teach about quite, quite often. So um, the thing to...
which you feel um, repelled or inspired or disgusted or highly interested, notice where your energy goes up and down and back. Um, so much to to talk about, but I'm going to stop there and let Brooke take it from here about um, the whole idea of this. Okay, perfect. And this is one of our mainstay talks. Is it's so often as hard. And so, for those of you who have already been in our classes, who already know about takeaway you've heard us teach about them and still it just takes a lot of time for it to really sink in. Um, so I should just uh, expose and um, talk you guys through some of the takeaways and, and share what that moment feel in the book like you're really being connected to you, which means that the author is very intentionally working in a kind of way. And so the ways that we describe this in our teaching is that, you, um, you know, that you take the mirror, right, that is kind of reflecting to you as you are writing your memoir and you're uncovering all of the things that really matter to you. And then you turn that mirror outward and you start to share and show your reader um, why your experiences are universal, why they're not just your experiences, why they also belong to the reader. Now, when you do that, it's not 100% of the time that the reader is going to connect and go, oh my God, totally on the same page with you. If they don't connect with you, that's what happens when you don't like a memoir. <laughs> you know, you don't like it because the reader was not able to connect with you. But when you love it and it resonates, that's because that author has been able to touch you in a way. And what that signifies is that that author was able to give you a strong takeaway and not just make their memoir only about them, but instead they were able to make it about universal human emotions in such a way that it connected, okay, it, it hit. So um, when they're issue driven, um, and this is, you know, I don't know that I can absolutely say that I think this is unique to issue driven books. I think this can happen um, with any kind of memoir, but there's a lot of stating of fact with issue driven books because both of these authors talk about the nature of being an alcoholic, what alcoholism is, what it's like to be a girl. They, they state facts. So they, they come out and they'll say something um, just very, very, that you might understand to be true too. So for instance, um, this is one in which Corin, she, she says her last name, Zelkis. She tells you that in the book. So Zelkis says, uh, in my experience, there is a bar and a drink for every mood. But she could have said, there is a bar and a drink for every mood. She didn't need to say, in my experience. She goes on to say, sorrow has a certain taste and joy has a certain atmosphere. You can't indulge your gladness anywhere that has cement floors where people watch infomercials in the bar's lofted TV or where $2 buys you a shot of tequila and two tall boys. So what I like about this sentence is that she says, sorrow has a certain taste and joy has a certain atmosphere. It's a declaration. And both of them are doing this all the time in these two books. There, there's a lot of declaring and not being afraid to take chances. Uh, Carolyn Knapp says, no is an extraordinarily complicated word when you're drunk. This isn't just because drinking impairs your judgment in specific situations like parties or dates. It's because drinking interferes with the larger, murkier business of identity of forming a sense of the self as strong and capable and aware. Um, it borders on um, psychology sometimes. I think Carolyn Knapp is better at that actually than Corin is. She is a little more mature. She's in her late 30s when she's writing this book and Corin by contrast is in her 20s. So it's got a very different flavor to it. Um, Carolyn Knapp says, it's true. It's a statement of fact that alcohol was key 
to that feeling. And she's, she had just described this feeling of alcohol as an armor, you know, that she, she coated, she was coated from the inside with a warm liquid armor. And then she says, it's a statement of fact that alcohol was key to that feeling. So there's a, a lot of times in our classes, we're teaching you guys how to, how to be firm, how to state something um, unequivocally, right? To just take it on and say, this is true. This is my truth. And that is part of the key to take away. Um, both of them share other women's stories. Interestingly, Corin always shares stories of being in the dynamic. So she is part of the story and she's sharing with her friends and situations and things that they do. Um, Carolyn Knapp, I think because she went through AA and she was a journalist as well, shares a lot of stories of other women that are not connected to her at all. Sometimes they're men, but most often they're women. And so she'll just kind of dive in and, and start sharing about someone else's story. And she does it a lot. She'll be kind of in scene narration. And then she'll all of a sudden she'll say, my friend Mary, blah, blah, blah. And then she'll share her story you know, my friend Evelyn, and then she'll share her story. And, and she's not connected at all. What she's doing is she's telling their stories of hitting rock bottom or their stories of, you know, obscene drunkenness or whatever it is. Uh, I, I write here that I particularly like Zelkis's observations of being a girl, um, the meta view of the culture. For me, this was the most powerful part of the book. And so, you know, if you're the farthest thing from a 20 year old girl, <laughs> you might read this through the lens of trying to understand 20 year old girls. Um, if you have a daughter or a granddaughter, uh, I think it's actually quite disturbing um, what, what kinds of pressures girls feel. And she really does tap into that in such a profound way. Interestingly, neither of these women had um, you know, any kind of trauma or uh, physical abuse or sexual abuse upbringing that led them to being an alcoholic, which, you know, sometimes there's some big reason that things happen. And I sometimes hear people in memoir saying, oh, well, I didn't have a tragic childhood, so I don't really feel like I have a story to tell. Um, these guys pulled out their stories from, you know, just being self-conscious, from having anxiety and from that leading to a desire to sort of stuff their feelings and the alcoholism came on very, very gradually for both of them. And Carolyn Knapp even writes about that. You know, she says, for me, alcohol was like a long swan dive um, or alcoholism rather. Um, you know, it, it didn't just come on one day and that's a powerful way of framing it. And so these stories are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're resonant for that reason. You know, they're not trying to shock and awe. I, I sometimes talk about um, not getting engaged in the trauma Olympics. And I think, and what I mean by that is that people like to read about hardship. They want you to be honest and aware. They want you to be able to speak to your flaws and not try to be, you know, sitting on an ivory tower, of course, because that does not make you a likable narrator. Um, on, on the flip side of that, they don't want you to be so messed up that they're worried for you, you know, that they start to wonder, is this narrator even okay? Um, because you, you have to show that you've come to the other side of it and that you make sense of your unhealthy behavior. So if you have an issue-driven memoir or an addiction memoir, if you're still in it, um, that can be kind of difficult. You know, it, it, it's a good time to take notes. I have pause, and I think that it takes a little distance. I have met people who are kind of in the throes of various addictions. Um, but it's the same thing for personality disorders, you know, which is technically an issue driven memoir and, and you can't change your personality disorder. You know, like I've worked with authors who have written bipolar um, and depression memoirs and they're in it, you know, but usually they've got some kind of um, stable thing going on with their medication that allows them to at least have some. That said, you also have to be able to find yourself back to the raw feeling of your addiction or of you know, whatever issue you have, and that's dangerous. So you do need to be careful um, and find some support if this is your particular. Well, 
you know, so be, be care. The last point here is the art to read it while you're at it. So I, we, got, we got a couple of advanced emails from people who had some complaints about the books, which we always appreciate. You know, if you take our four week classes and there's more um, speaking involved, you can do more Q&A and we'll have some Q&A today. Uh, but it's okay to be a, a critic, you know, to ask like, why the hell did Corin just write scene after scene after scene of how messed up she is? You know, that, that is a good question to ask. But the other good question, why do people want to read this book? Why is this a New York Times bestseller? What did she do well? What did she tap into? Um, for any book you don't like that has sold well or has reached the hearts of millions, you might want to ask yourself that question. And I think that Linda Joy and I can find really incredible redeeming qualities in both of these books. Um, I mean, for me, Drinking a Love Story is one of my favorite memoirs of all time. And what I love about it is that she is just a little more mature when she wrote the book. Her insights are pretty incredible. And um, her, her, how she talks about AA and the people that she met and her, uh, you know, her, her huge aha at the end of the book um, is that she had always believed that she was, um, that she, she drank because she was unhappy. And, and she turns that around at the end of the book and has this very profound awakening that, and asks herself, you know, could it be possible that I'm unhappy because I drink? Mm -hmm. And, and that is a game changer and it lands with you as the reader is like, oh my God, it's so simple, but it's so profound. So uh, if these are books that you guys are interested in, and if you do decide to join us for the four week class, you don't have to read the whole thing, but you can. Okay, so here we are looking at um, the looking at the different stories. We're going to go deeper into this in the four week class, of course. But um, I want to give you a few examples of of how these two people um, look use structure and how we can sort of compare them and see how to, how to think about it yourself. So um, one of them, one of the is uh, how they chose tenses and their narrative style. So yes, I can't tell you how old I was. The memory is long gone, et cetera. She starts right in. In present tense, and then in a couple paragraphs, she's in scene right in her kitchen. <laughs> and then she gives us the date, how old she is, and the date, and when things are happening in time. And she also then in the, the what we call the now moments, uh, three, two pages later, she's, she's talking about her experience of alcohol, I feel the same hot flush of embarrassment as I did. Tingle spreads itself up the back of my neck. Years from now, I'll find myself processing the memory the same way. I'll want to find foreshadowing in the events of this day. So that's an ex one example of many, 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 many times that she pops out of the now scene and goes into the conditional tense, I will. Uh, I will want to. This will happen later. I will reflect on this in a new way. And so, therefore, what she does is she offers us uh, fluidity in time, but she manages time all the way through. And so does Carolyn Knapp. It's so interesting how they both 
have um, now Carolyn Knapps is she mostly is using past tense, but when she needs to use present tense to make a point or to um, you know to deliver some information, she will do that. She says, um, "Oh, this is something you." <laughs> Um, quoted a second ago, Brooke. Oh, but it was well, okay. We didn't we didn't check it. We didn't. No, we time. didn't. Uh, um, but in the middle of page sixty-eight, she says, "It's true. It's a statement of fact." And I thought it was so interesting that she's in, in the present tense in the first part of the sentence, and then that alcohol was key to that feeling I had learned that years earlier, et cetera, et cetera. So she's analyzing her feelings, and she's paying attention i mean these these two women obviously these are highly edited books and it's not the first um you know the first draft but they're paying attention to when they use the present tense and i can um one of another one of the themes that weaves through well both both books in different ways with corin it's being in love and being interested in boys in what i call a a, a voice of of innocence. I'll talk more about that in a second. And in um, in Carolyn Knapp's, it's it's also about men and and dating and sex and all these things. She also weaves in. She even says things like, "Alcohol felt like a cement in female sexuality. At least it did to me. Over the years, the two would become so deeply linked that for the longest time, I simply couldn't imagine one without the other." A first kiss without drinks, forget it. Sex without liquor, no way. And then she stops that reflection. We call it the narrator is reflecting, thinking, and presenting what it's like for her. A snapshot. I am 19, sitting in a fancy restaurant in Santa Fe, New Mexico with my boyfriend. We are both dressed up. He's wearing a tan suit. We order a round of drinks, margaritas. So, and then she, so she drops out of her reflection as a narrator and presents a small snippet of a scene and then goes back to reflecting. Um, so there's a lot of fluidity in, in actually both of these books, which can be confusing when you're trying to write your own. And uh, what we don't know is how they wrote them. Did they write them straightforwardly exactly as they are? Or did they come up with different now moments that they wove in with that they and then that did they come up with other moments where they knew that they were reflecting back it's hard to know but we do put on different thinking caps when we're figuring out uh, <laughs> uh, where am I going to put this how am I going to present that and just know that you have a lot of uh, craft choices um, you know you have the tense choice um, and then this other thing that we're, we've been talking about is structure and moving a, a, around in time. Uh, in Smashed, I want to just touch on that. We're going to talk more about structure in our longer course too, but uh, she has parts. Uh, Eat, Pray, Love had parts with chapters in it too. And so this book also, Initiation, The Usual, Excess, and Abuse. And so you can feel the arc of time through there as well and how things go downhill just by reading the title of the parts. And then in each part, there are titles of chapters. And so in that way, she grouped her thinking and her presentation to us. Remember the themes uh, that she's presenting to us. In uh, NAP, she has more of a... Uh, a, narr a narrative, a kind of overall narrative, but everything we, it's like crocheting something. She, excuse me, she picks up different colors of threads all the way through and weave them. So here's a few of her chapters. Love, the double life, destiny, hunger, and vodka, veritas, sex, drinking alone, on and on. And then you can see how it's going to go. Then later, hitting bottom, help, and healing. One thing you will notice is that the books do go on for a while, showing all the ways they mess themselves up, which, <laughs> frankly, I, I got a little, I'm like, ah, oh, but I'm a therapist. It's not fair. I mean, I was just like, don't you get it yet? But, um, hey, I also know 
from personal experience that you don't get it till you get it. And and so they they do show, uh, and I was talking with Brooke about this. I said, I'm trying to understand how it's helpful to the reader to have, you know, 55 examples of being drunk and falling down and vomiting and, you know, being in danger. I was kind of worried a lot for both of these people. And I, and, and we talked about how, if a lot of people are reading these books, it's extremely likely that they need to read these different examples of all these different ways that we do harm to ourselves, we get lost in our addiction. And in here it's alcohol, sometimes it's sexual, sexual abuse or it's having bad relationships or whatever it is, or having fights with the family uh, or trying to recover from heartbreak. I mean, really it's a human thing and uh and we really we can't judge other people about that and there's a reason that they did it part of it is that they needed to write the truth that their truth as it happened and the other is there is learning for us in it so i i i felt i felt fine about it i want to talk about the voice of innocence and the voice of wisdom uh, for a second uh, before we move on so uh, you will see this quite easily in these books. The voice of uh, innocence is the the young girl in high school, for instance, on page, um, let me see, this, page 28. She's, you, you can feel how young she is. I mean, you know it from the way she starts off, but she says, August turns to September and I realized I didn't have a summer love last summer. I didn't meet a boy when I was gathering shells in Cape Cod. My ne eyes never met someone else's across a pebbled beach. Tasting alcohol just once is as hopeful and heartbreaking as kissing a boy just once. It feels like the time I kissed a boy in the coat room at a wedding, et cetera, et cetera. So she is talking about high school and things that people do in high school and hanging out with the guys and playing guitar and singing. I didn't have that much fun in high school. I was a little jealous, but um, you know, and it, it is a very contemporary voice too. The, the, the language usage is very contemporary. And um, she also drops into informational issue, informational things that she wants to share about drinking. And she also, goes forward and presents the later self who understands things differently. She says, I decide on page 75, 75, I decide to tell a fraction of the truth. This is after she went into a coma and almost died. And she's talking with her parents finally about what happened. I tell a fraction of the truth that will become something I will tell my parents for years in times of distress. I like to think it as the whole truth and nothing but the truth's second cousin. They may not share all the same physical characteristics, but at least they're related. Years later, again, she's writing from later, it's hard to remember the precise story that I tell them. It's exactly that, a story. I shift facts around, etc. So um, in the voice of innocence she's doing the telling in the voice of wisdom she's um she's the she's a, she's only a few years older after she got sober when she wrote the book so as as brooke said it's very much it's very close to when things happen and uh, carolyn knapp comes in as, as brooke already said you're going to notice all the many ways that she offers um you know the this is what I did, and this is what AA is about. This is how, these are the statistics on drinking. They both offer statistics. I find that really fascinating. Um, so there's, again, if you're writing about a theme, B, or any, actually any kind of writing, you're going to be using these techniques, and they they do work in, in every memoir. But when you're thinking about themes, you have them kind of at the front of your mind as you choose your scenes and what you're going to present. Yeah, and I would say that the um, that uh, statistics that you're talking about 
do tend to show up in issue-driven books because there are statistics to draw from. And that's one of the things, too, that makes it, kind of anchors it a bit more. Um, and lots of writers who come to memoir from having been journalists, I also think it's a natural thing that they, that they draw from. So we want to give you guys Q&A, and there's already so many good questions coming, so please do um, keep putting the questions in, and we're going to go back to them. We simply want to give you an offer. We always do these calls free, and we know that some of you always join us for the free ones, and that is awesome, and we want to continue to invite you um, no matter what, but we also want to always <laughs> introduce you to opportunities because we teach these craft-based courses um, every spring and every fall. Uh, and for the time being, we're going to keep teaching these books because uh, it just is so helpful to look at how to do what they're doing and draw from other people in these very, very specific ways. So it's $75 uh, through the end of the day tomorrow, just because we're going to send out the recordings. And that's a pretty good deal for a uh, four-week class. So we hope that you'll join us at the, at the home page. You can just access it from our site. And then uh, the six-month class is a discount as well. So I'm not going to do too hard of a sell here. We want to get to the Q&A. Um, but if you're interested in joining us for uh, the six-month class, that starts in June, June through December. And you can get information about it on the program details page at our at our site, writeyourbookinsixmonths.com. And then an announcement, which is that last year we did the Magic of Memoir um, in-person conference. A lot of you were there and it was awesome. And we're doing it again this year, only bigger and better. And it's gonna be different content. So if you went last year and you feel like you don't know if you should come again, you should because we're doing a completely <laughs> different um, kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. touching upon some of the same stuff, of course, but that's at magicofmemoir.com, and it's going to be in California again. We're, we're keeping it local to us, but it's, it will be in Oakland, and the venue is spectacular with a view of the bay, um, quite quite gorgeous, mm -hmm. so we, we hope you'll look into it. Yeah, these, uh, these uh, both the courses and the conference, uh, there's a lot of content that people get, and I don't know about you all, but, but every time I take a new course, I learn something new that even if it's on the same theme so um, I think we'll you'll get a lot out of, of, of all the stuff that we're presenting in the next few months all right awesome yes I agree I thought I had a QA and a slide but I oh, don't well. so you guys that's okay I'm gonna I think this is good because we're, mm -hmm. we'll leave this up for the links and everything mm -hmm. so um, well, here's a good question from Cindy she asked this question do you always have to be likable Mm. You have to be relatable, wouldn't you say that, Brooke? Yeah, absolutely. And people, you'll hear sometimes agents and editors saying that they like unreliable narrators. Mm. Um, and what that means is it's not, it's different than relatable, right? You do have to be relatable, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily have to be reliable. You can, you can be a mess. You know, you can show yourself, go to um, the depth and to, some, to hit bottom even, um, but we have to be rooting for you to get to the other side and through your mess, you also have to have a certain level of self-awareness, which is what I referenced earlier. You know, you, you have to be able to do some self-observation, which I think both of these authors do very well. You know, they're making horrible choices. Um, but they they wake up the next morning, you know, in a stranger's bed, for instance, in both cases, and you see the sort of dawning awareness of what's happened and the denial that goes forward, you know, but they, they're walking you through it. And, and so that's relatable. You know, obviously, it's relatable if you've done it, but it's even relatable, I think, if you haven't. So I, um, I, I found that to be true. And you don't always have to be likable. You certainly don't have to be perfect. You, can, you right. can and should show your bad choices. Well, and because we all, if we, if we read somebody who's just basically presenting only their good side, we are like, what are you leaving out? Because we're not going to believe that. Um, and some authors are edgier than others, and they're not completely likable, but they're relatable. So it depends on the voice, and uh, it's good to get feedback on that after you've done a whole bunch of writing. See yeah. what other people are feeling. 
So here's a question from Evelyn. Are there more declarations and takeaways naturally in addiction memoirs compared to coming of age memoirs? Mm. What do you I, think? I, I think mm. probably because the thing about coming of age and if you're writing a coming of age, I don't know if you caught our uh, Glass Castle class, Carol, but one of the things that we shared, or, or Evelyn, sorry, mm -hmm. um, was uh, that because it's young and because it's a voice of, of um, innocence, oftentimes takeaways are being handled through the adults. You know, kind of the, the, the adults are saying things and the reader is kind of getting a, oh, got it. And the kid is sort of making sense of things. Of course, you have a precocious child, you know, always in coming of age because they, they kind of have to be. So there are other ways that, that you could do declarations. But I would probably say that that's true, you know, that, that there would be more in issue driven memoirs simply because the way that you're observing the issues can sometimes stem from a sort of fact based um, or experience that a child hasn't quite had yet. Mm, that's a good point. Um, okay. So Margaret said, would any of these, or would these books, I guess these specific books, be inter of interest to young men? Is there anything about them that would be helpful for young men? Hmm. Well, I think as women, we always think that young men could learn more about our point of view in the world. <laughs> um, it's interesting what's being said about some current TV shows now, for instance, The Outlander and how much it's a woman's point of view. And I didn't really realize how much it was a woman's point of view because I related to it. Uh, but people are talking about it in terms of, of, of people, men being able to learn more about how women experience the world and sex and their own bodies. Um, and also the other thing is that men are addicted too. And who knows, I mean, their, their experience is no doubt different in some ways. And there are men who, of course, write about that. Uh, but I read books by men, and I'm interested in the universal um, learning that they're offering me. So I think it, it, it operates in both directions. Yeah, I mean, the question of young men is kind of a different question, though, you know, because I think that young mm -hmm. men should read books like this, I think especially Corin's, because it's, mm, yes. oh, man, it, it would be really, mm -hmm. it's a rough view of what, what young people are like um, and, and if they you know mm -hmm. have the awareness to get through it I think it could ultimately be quite helpful. Yeah it could be very educational. Um, okay so Becky said is life-changing loss considered an issue? And I think it is. I, I think it I think it is it depends on what your loss is I guess is the question. Um, when you say life-changing loss it, it stems from something. You know, so if you, for instance, are writing a book about having lost um, a, a child to disease or, um, you know, if there's a particular loss, then that I think is, would be issue driven. Um, if you have a lot of different losses, it's kind of like each of those losses is an issue. Um, you know, like if, if one was disease and another was, you know, a car accident and another was, you know, some loss in, if, your own, um, that gets a little more bifurcated. And I think then it makes you have to sort of figure that out. So it's, it's a little bit of a nuanced question, but I think my answer is it could be. Um, okay, so Paige says, I wanna write as my experience as a mother of a drug addict, would this still be considered a memoir and showing how his addiction affected me? You would, wouldn't it? Yes, it's your story. It's like the father of the beautiful boy, you know, that, that story. It's your experience of what that was like for you, what you worried about, what you tried, how you maybe tried to get them to change. Um, they would take people into the inner world of a parent who also can't completely control the child and is worried about the outcome. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We have a book coming up on the uh, She Writes Press list called Blinded by Hope, which mm. is exactly that topic, you know, of showing how a parent can't and doesn't give up hope to her own detriment, you know, um, mm. and, and sort of the codependence that exists in these relationships. I think it's hugely important, actually, to write these stories. I mean, it's, it's 
it's cathartic, of course, for you and, and a lot of people need to tell their stories. But ultimately, I think that being the parent of an addict and showing your struggle and how, how you got through it, or even if you didn't get through it, even if there is no resolu resolution, that, that is a, um, a, a real connection to another reader. So I encourage you, Paige, to keep going with that. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck uh, with it. Yeah, uh, yeah, good luck. So Peter says, you talk about issue-driven memoir, but aren't just all memoirs issue-driven in some way? Um, <laughs> well, yeah. So talk about that from the publisher's point of view, because I think it's that that, that will help, you know, the conversation. Yeah. I mean, the answer is no, right? Because you have things that are much more thematic. I mean, travel memoir, for instance, is not particularly issue-driven. It's an experience. Um, the, hero, the heroine's journey or the hero's journey is a journey of transformation, and there might be some issues that are at the core, um, but when I'm talking about an issue, I'm really talking about a specific, um, you know, like, uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to think, like cooking, for instance, is not an issue, you know, and there, so Julie and Julia, which was a book about cooking the way, her way through um, Julia Child's cookbook, was not an issue driven book. You know, it was really about cooking, which is thematic. And travel books are thematic. Coming of age memoirs are not issue driven. You know, they're, they're really about the experience of being a child and what happened, usually in dysfunctional relationships and how the child survived. So when publishers are talking about issue driven books, they're really specifically talking about things that are, um, that you can point to, you know, that you could look up as a news item. You know, like alcoholism and drug addiction could be a headline, and that is maybe one way to try to define it. You know, to ask yourself, could my, um, could I, fi could I find my my issue by typing it into Google and having it come up? You know, in a in a search on the, you know, headlines. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, that that I think is one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. But thank you for the question. We we like to be challenged as well. It keeps us keeps us on our toes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's very good. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, we're always talking about themes, but this is a, a slice or an angle off of that, that definition. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, Shabnam says, uh, thank you, and you're welcome. Uh, my memoir is about the time that my daughter and I separated with a lot of flashbacks to explain what caused everything, and would that be considered an issue-driven memoir? Um, so that's a good okay. question. I mean, I think it depends on what separated you. You know, I, I, I don't know what your um, ethnic background is, Shabnam, if, if you were separated for reasons of your country of origin, for instance, and it were political um, in nature, then it could be very much issue driven. You know, if it, it's more like not without my daughter, for instance, comes to mind just because you're saying you were separated and there's all this stuff that happened. Um, I would say that that book was more of a journey, you know, it, it certainly had some issues at its core, but, um, you know, so sometimes you could have some overlap, but, you know, reach, let, let us know what you're working on and uh, in an email and we can help you uh, get a little bit tighter on that. Um, Carol is inviting us to come to the East Coast. <laughs> and, and to host us in Rochester. So thank you for that, Carol. We'll certainly take it under consideration. Uh, Okay, so this just is not in winter. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This is a person whose name mm -hmm. I can't read. HGL. Um, mm -hmm. Not writing about addiction, at least not in the physical sense. I've been hostage to litigation where my home and support and integrity have been at, at stake. Mm. Um, and so um, she's, he or she is saying, um, I need some writerly help discussing and deciding how to write the story. Mm. There's more, but I think, you know, starting with you, Linda Joy, right, with um, NAMW. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yes, there's, there's support systems available for free at, at the National Association of Memoir Writers. We have a monthly roundtable discussion, it's called, and it's free to all. And it's also recorded, and you can go to the site, namw.org, and actually listen to quite a few of these. These discussions about books, these are most of the people that are talking on these discussions are people who, who didn't know how to write a book, learned how to write their book, write their memoir, and then finally publish it. And so I interview these authors and we talk about a whole lot of things having to do with all this. 
The other resource is if you do become a member of NAMW, we're going to have a sale at Memorial Day, as a matter of fact. Um, we have a group coaching call once a month where everybody gets on the line and talks about their book and their process, their title, their theme, what they're struggling with, and shares it with each other. So that's that's really been, they've been really liking that. So those are a couple places. Um, and, you know, there's, we're always trying somewhere. to figure out new stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so we'll take a few more questions. We're going to end on the hour. Um, and, well, this is a good question. Cindy asks, is it always necessary to use the first person point of view in a memoir? Um, and, you know, in lots of memoirs, increasingly now we're seeing a lot of second person. I mean, almost every new memoir I read, there's a lot of second person. It's very interesting. Third mm. person gets a little more awkward mm. because then you right. might be saying, you know, Cindy goes to the store and, you know, people might think there's something wrong with you. So um, yeah, it is generally first person and, and lo lots of sprinkling of second person. With, yeah, you, the second person, is woven in. I had this question last week on one of the NAMW teleseminars, and her writing group had told her that, that she should write her memoir in third person. <laughs> so my guest and I just jumped all over that and said, well, are they memoirists? I mean, you know, who, who told you that? But we basically said write it in first person because we're looking for the inside story of your experience. And you can use different techniques, but it's your story. It's your internal journey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so Rachel is asking, do you think illness memoirs fit into the issue-driven memoir genre? And I think yes, you know, I, I absolutely do. I think uh, cancer memoirs, um, I recently read an ALS memoir. Um, I mm. think that they're, they're very topical. Um, and I, I met a woman in Tucson who was writing a book about having been raised by a mother with Munchausen. Mm. Um, and I was like, I want to read that book, you know, first of all. But secondly, I mm -hmm. thought it was very issue driven. Um, it ties into a question, actually, if I could go kind of do two at once, Linda Joy. Mm -hmm. This woman, um, Julie says, it seems that more people can relate to coming of age memoirs versus the fewer people that have actually been through heroin addiction. And what I want to say about that is like this woman who had the mother with Munchausen, I thought there's a big audience for that, you know, even though few people are raised with parents with Munchausen. And the, you know, it, what's interesting is that there's a lot of people who want to read about experiences they haven't had. And there's something very particular about drug and alcohol addiction. I mean, with alcohol, it's obviously more prevalent in our culture. And so you don't have to be an alcoholic to have a complicated relationship with alcohol. Uh, mm -hmm. Heroin is a little more hardcore, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, but that said, you know, I like this book that I mentioned at the beginning, The Big Fix, it is selling thousands and thousands of copies. And I don't think it's heroin users who are buying the book. Right. You know, I, I think it's people who are just like, how and why does that happen? What's the psychology of that person? Um, you know, how did they get through to the other side? People want to read about other people bearing their souls. And yeah. to, you know, just really the heart felt like, oh my God, this was the absolute shit. And, mm -hmm. and this is how I came out of it. So, you know, don't limit your audience. I mean, I'm not suggesting Margaret that you, you know, or Julie, excuse me, that you, you know, have one or the other, but anyone who is writing this, you know, don't limit your audience. Mm -hmm. So we're at time. Um, mm -hmm. And you guys have been wonderful with wonderful questions. We could have done an hour of questions. Sorry, we didn't get to everybody, but please look us up. Um, you can email us. You can put your questions to us on Facebook if you want to, because we both have Facebook pages and NAMW, National Association of Memoir Writers, has a Facebook group that you can join and you can ask questions about memoir there. So mm -hmm. um, please join us for the four weeks. We'd love to have you. It's, a, um, you know, with lots of Q&A and, and interactive there in a smaller group. So um, we mm -hmm. will see you around the block either way. Yes, thank you all for being with us and good luck on your stories and your books. Bye-bye. Bye, Brooke. Good night, Linda Joy. Thanks as always. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye.